Hey, hello everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown and this is hangout number 54. Let me say hello to everybody and, and I really apologize uh, <clears throat> for the fact I put three o'clock on the show and it wasn't until 7 p.m. Little typo there. Um, let me say who's here in the chat room. Molly is here. Hi, Lisa S is here and Mary is here and Florence is here and Ms. Lee is here and let's see, Corey is here. And Anne is here, and I can't seem to move. And what the heck? Sorry, I'm having. Oh, <laughs> I'm having problems here. <laughs> I'm not even sure if I got your names uh, because I can't see tonight. I don't know what's going on. There's something weird uh, in my in the lighting, and I can't seem to fix it. So anyway, welcome everybody. But Woody, <laughs> here we go again. Last week I said what? Uh, criminal profiler. So now I'm going to say hello to everybody. <laughs> I'm in good shape. Uh, anyway, hello, everybody. And if you're not um, in the chat room and you'd like to be, please do click on Patreon uh, below and you can join Patreon and you can be at all the live shows, which are eight a month. Um, and uh, and otherwise, please just uh, subscribe to the channel, like, share and all of that stuff. Anyway, hello, everyone. <laughs> oh, and Molly says, you see, I can't see tonight. Maybe it's because... My glasses are really dirty, and I thought I'd clean them, but <laughs> apparently not. Okay, and Molly says, let me look at this. I have to go down here now. He can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. I appreciate that, both uh, both Mary and Molly. Um, very important way to start the show. Okay, I'm glad you can hear me. I've had some really interesting requests for uh, the, the show, the Hangout today, and I'm going to try to uh, address some of them. Uh, but let me start out with saying this first, because I, I kind of had a good laugh over this one. So if anybody's been to my um, Facebook page, I, I put I put this picture up this week and I said, I said, it's, 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 it's rainy and dreary in uh, Maryland where I normally live. But I am enjoying the sitting here looking at the Aegean Sea and the beautiful the beautiful ancient ruins of Greece, this beautiful building here. And uh, <laughs> I got a lot of people who said, oh, that's just wonderful, Pat. I'm so glad you're on vacation. And isn't that just great? And I'm thinking, you know, I could swindle a whole bunch of you. And I'm going to do a show on the Tinder swindler. And y'all better take a look at that picture again. <laughs> um that that building is a water tower. It's about a mile down the street, right next to Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, so <laughs> that is not an, a, a Grecian temple, and actually, there's no sea behind there either. It's just the way the photo took. So <laughs> now I know who to con of all my wonderful friends. <clears throat> Sorry about that, guys, <laughs> but I had a good laugh over it anyway. Um, <laughs> so hold on a second. I'm trying to. Oh, really? Your daughter is now, says my, my, my daughter is, I'm having, I really can't see. Wait a minute. Hold on, guys. I swear to God, I can't see anything. Maybe I put that light too close to me and it's just making it difficult. Or maybe I'm just going to, maybe I made my screen too dark. Hold on, everybody. I just, I can't even see what you're saying to me. So just let me, let me fix my, the error of my ways here. And now that doesn't work. Oh, there we go. Just hold on, folks. I, I love having patient people here because <laughs> some days I need patience from my viewers and my patrons. And okay, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna go more more, more glare in my glasses. Oh, I can see you guys now. Okay. You see, this is the problem. You see, you see the glasses without the glasses. And if you don't wear glasses, you never have an issue. You can put your 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 screen really bright, you can see everything. But the minute you put glasses on, you get this problem. You see, you see, see the glare comes off all the lights. And I've never found a great way to solve this. And there's not really good ideas on it. So what you normally do is try not to lift your head up. And also, to you take the uh, screen and you you make it dark so that the, the light from the screen doesn't reflect in your eyes as well, because into your glasses, because the screen will do that too. <sighs> but then you can't see anything. So... That's the struggle. Oh, <laughs> Lisa. Okay, so Lisa, always visit your Facebook page. So Lisa, did you think I was in Greece? <laughs> Don't I wish I was in Greece. Mm. 
So I wish I was there. <laughs> um, what? Hold, hold on a second. Oh, 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 oh. This is, oh, this is terrible. Okay, hold on a second. Ms. Leah, I don't know why it says, it says you were blocked for five minutes. I didn't do that. I did not. I, well, I'm going to put a little, I don't even know if, if she can see anything. I think when I was trying to see the screen, I hit something. <laughs> I did not block Ms. Leah. I didn't block you. Maybe I did, but it wasn't not on purpose. What the heck? How do you how do you get the time out gone? They have this little little um thing that says Ms. Leah was blocked for five minutes, and I don't know what I hit. Sorry, Ms. Leah. So come back, come back. <laughs> uh, well, she's got probably four, three or four more minutes, and she's probably fuming, going, "Why did she do that? What did I say?" Didn't say anything wrong. So anyway, while we wait for Ms. Leah to come back so I can apologize again, um, I, I got a, just a couple of amusing stories to start out with. What we're talking about, things that happen to people, uh, situations they put themselves in and then become a victim. And by the way, before I go there with that, I just want to want to bring this up because I think it's I, I did this show. I, I did this show on uh, the, the kindergarten teacher. Um, who was murdered, raped and murdered, abducted, raped and murdered down in Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, by the piece of garbage that you see there staring into the camera. Um, and the show, if you haven't seen it, please, I'm going to link it below because I think, and if you have any place you can share, I think it's really important. And I don't usually ask people to share specific videos, but this one's super important. Um, I was afraid people were going to come and say, oh, you're blaming the victim because that's all over the internet. Uh, people are saying, oh, see, I knew as soon as that jogger story came out, came out that she went jogging at four in the morning. I knew that people are going to say she shouldn't have been jogging at four in the morning and she shouldn't have been wearing those little shorts and the little top. She shouldn't have been. She shouldn't have been. They're blaming the victim instead of blaming the system and blaming the bad person that did it. This this is where it always goes. Um, and I constantly try to say it's not sometimes when you're trying to help people, it's not that you're blaming the victim, but you're just trying to help them understand how you become a victim. And let me, one more time. This is the book, How to Save Your Daughter's Life. Um, right now you can get it for like $3.99 as a used copy or new copy in good condition off of Amazon. You can go to eBay. It is on audio at Amazon and I hate it because it's not my voice. It's some really sweet woman talking like this. And I think they didn't want to pay me money. So they just had somebody in the office do the, do the book. I never even knew it happened. Um, and it's not on Kindle. I don't, uh, the company, I don't know how good things to say about that publisher <laughs> anyway, but uh, this book, I have everything about how you can prevent your daughter or even yourself from becoming a victim. And I cover things like partying, drinking, drugging, casual sex, and gangs. All of those will get you. Get you in trouble. Date rape because you're out there with somebody you don't really trust. You, you get your drink. You go to their, their room with them and all things go wrong. Danger of social networking and the Internet. Risky relationships. Bad boyfriends, bad girlfriends, whatever. Stalkers. Then child predators, serial rapists and serial killers. And the sex trade and sex trafficking. I have all this in here because I want people to help young women. And I didn't write a book for young men at this point, uh, not get caught up in these things and put themselves in situations that increase their risk of getting in trouble. It's, it's, a, it's a risk thing. Um, when you talk about people, you say low risk, high risk for victims, low risk, high risk. Now, this doesn't mean a low risk victim can't be murdered. This is very true. I mean, sometimes no matter what you do, some creep manages to break into your house get past the security systems and somehow get to into, into your room and kill you. You were low risk, but you still unfortunate circumstances, but you have a better chance of not getting victimized as a low risk person. than if you're a high risk person, high risk, meaning going jogging at four in the morning, it's very high risk activity going hiking by yourself in the, the Shenandoah mountains. Sorry, high risk activity. Um, for, for fem females uh, or even a small dude, um, uh, getting extremely drunk and not being able to control the circumstances that you're in, high risk activity, getting into the sex trade, high risk activity, drugs, high risk activity. So these are things that 
are just a reality. And if you want to save lives, you have to talk about things realistically. So I did talk about the dangers that, unfortunately, this, this kindergarten teacher put herself in by 4, 4 a.m. running. Now, maybe she did like running a lot and she was into marathons and all that. It doesn't mean activity still isn't risky, regardless of how wonderful the activity is. Uh, and now she's dead. Uh, and do I blame the creep that killed her? Well, heck yes. But here's the problem, folks. We have to fix the criminal justice system as best we can. We have to keep predators off the street as best we can. But no matter how much we do the right thing in that, and we don't do much of the right thing in that, there's always going to be that one or two creepy dudes out there. And they're out there. And you can't just ignore the fact they're out there. So, you know, you got to be vigilant and protect yourself. And it, yeah, I wish everybody had the right to do all the things they'd like to do without any risk, but that's just not the way the world is. I mean, it sucks, but that's the way the world is. And do women pay a higher price for this? Yes, we do. We're smaller. Children also. Children are, uh, their children are born into some high risk situations and they don't even have a choice. So, because their parents put them in a high risk situation. Um, so the children are really get the worst of it all, they have, their rights are highly stomped upon. Um, and um, women are next on the list. And then we can keep going. <laughs> but there's others. <coughs> uh oh, is Miss Leah back yet? Uh, Miss Leah, where are you? <coughs> is that five? That's a long five minutes. Okay, Lila is here. Hi, Lila. Um, Carolina said, um, I thought your video on Eliza Fletcher, the Memphis jog who was killed, was excellent. Sure, she had the right to run alone at 4 a.m., but it's better to be alive than dead right. That's that's a good way of saying it. Um, it's just the way it is, you know. It, I, I mean, there's so many things I would like to do that I have to be very careful, you know, not to make the mistake of doing because I have to look around and say, okay. And as I get older, hold on a second. <coughs> Something in my throat. One minute. Um, as I get older, I recognize that older people become targets of, of uh, robbers. Why? Because they look, look at the older person, they say, easy target. They're, they're, more, they're frailer. They're not going to fight back. So they attack them. And they, you know, so as person gets older, one also has to say, well, that sucks. You know, <laughs> I went from being strong to eh, kind of a... I'm going to be easily victimized. And then you have to prepare for that and to protect yourself. Uh, the same thing is true for living alone. Living alone for a female and an elderly person is a high risk situation. Um, living with other people where, you know, that you trust around you gives you protection. Uh, so these are the things we have to think about. And then we have to ask ourselves if we're going to do something that's higher risk, we just have to say, is it worth it? And sometimes it is. I mean, people climb, people climb mountains and fall off. <laughs> you know, I don't want to do that. It's not a risk I want to take. But there are many people who think it's worth the risk because they love the excitement of climbing, and they've made that a big part of their lives. Now, I don't know. Maybe Eliza Fletcher did decide that it was worth the risk to to run at four in the morning because she wanted to participate in marathons and stuff and she didn't have other times to do it the sad thing is she had two children and i think that when you're a mom we might want to minimize some of those risks so florence says my niece is dressed so slutty i'm just sure something bad is going to happen plus they drink yeah and again you know people say you should be able to dress any way you want but the fact is predators look for girls that drink too much they look for girls who dress slutty. Why? Because they feel like they're easier to entice into a sexual situation. And it's not untrue, by the way. You know, if a girl's dressed like a church girl, probably she's less likely to just go along with some kind of sexual activity as a girl who is half naked. That's just that's the way life works. Um, that's the way it is. You know, it's the same problem we have with young men who dress like thugs. And they say, well, you shouldn't you, you, you shouldn't just look at me and say I'm a thug because I'm dressed like one. Well, you, you know, the reason I'm scared of you is because you look like a thug. <laughs> I told my two boys when they were growing up, you can't dress like a thug. You know, you just can't because you scare your neighbors. 
you scare a little old ladies, you know, you can't do that. It's just not right. Do you have to dress in a way that people aren't afraid of you? And if you dress like a thug, you make it treated like a thug. That's the way the world works, you know, so you've got it to make your choices. And as a mom, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to dress like a thug. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, and here's, so that was just a story. I just thought it just really bugged me uh, because I just felt it's again, so sad when this kind of thing happens. Now let's talk about a couple other, um, let's talk about another story out of Memphis, which this, in this particular case, um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Hold on a second. All right, here we go. So there's this guy running around Memphis. Memphis has had a bad week. They have. There's this this character. Here he is. And uh, yeah, he's only 19. And I'm going to talk about a problem we're having with it. a lot of uh, young people these days, which is really concerning. He is the guy that went on a shooting rampage and killed four people. Uh, and he recorded some of the actions on Facebook Live. So we're having this is Facebook, like the media is allowing certain people to get attention in a way that's very, very dangerous. And mass murderers love attention. So they love the media and they do love Facebook Live, you know, because they can be seen committing their crimes. He went on an hours long shooting rampage, gunning down at least four people. Now these people, let's see what, let's see what happened. Um, yeah, he also carjacked somebody. Let's see, when did it start? It began early Wednesday at 12.56 a.m. and continued... What? Wait a minute. It says 12.56 a.m. and continued to 8.30 p.m. Almost 24 hours. I think something's wrong with this report. It's ABC News, but I don't think I quite believe it's that many hours. Or maybe that's just when they finally caught him. Um, at least four people were killed and three others wounded in seven shootings across the city. After the shootings, the suspect carjacked a driver at gunpoint, speeding off in the victim's Dodge Challenger. And the, look, the victim of the uh, carjacking was uninjured. Um, the suspect left behind an SUV stolen from a woman he allegedly fatally shot earlier. So this is his second carjacking. The other person he carjacked is dead. Um, so there are at least eight crime scenes. Well, um, uh, the uh, police chief said he recorded at least some of his actions on Facebook Live, including when he opened fire inside a store on Jackson Avenue just before 6 p.m. So maybe he was doing this almost around the clock. Now, these people were not high, did not come, uh, they weren't in high risk activities. They just got shot, just existed. All right. This is where you just have really bad luck and you have really dangerous people out there. And sometimes, just like children get shot to death in a school, you, you just have bad luck. Um, really, really, really sad. And, but you know, but this guy. Let me talk about his um, uh, his his history. And this is this is where the some of the problem comes in. In February of 2020, he was 17. He was charged as an adult with attempted first degree murder, aggravated assault and using a firearm to commit a dangerous felony and reckless endangerment uh, with, with a deadly weapon. Um, he pleaded guilty to aggravated assault and was sentenced to three years behind bars. He was released from prison 11 months later. That's our problem. Okay, the guy is a dangerous, dangerous criminal, at a teenager. And I'm going to say he's running around with a gun, doing all this stuff. I'm going to say it's not his first rodeo. So he's probably been actually a, a juvenile, has a juvenile record that's going like this. And then he commits this attempted murder and he's out in 11 months. There's your problem with the, with the, with the, with the, with the system. Um, so yes, our, our, our criminal justice system, we need to do something about it, especially with violent felons. And uh, there's a great difference between selling some weed on a corner and, and robbing somebody with a gun. I mean, two different things. So, you know, one is a, you know, I mean, it's a misdemeanor in most, in most locations, but there's no such thing as a misdemeanor when you're robbing somebody with, with a gun. That's a felony crime and you ought to be, something ought to be done about it. But 11 months, what, he had good behavior? Hmm. Oh, 
<laughs> Thank you, Ms. Leah. I am back. No worries. It happens. You know, Ms. Leah, I was trying to, I think I was trying to see the thing because I had the light too low and I was clicking down. I accidentally must have clicked on whatever it is. I did that to you. My apologies. It wasn't on purpose. You did nothing wrong. <laughs> It just hit something funny. But anyway, um, that's the other guy who's running around right now. Um, piece of crap. Um, yeah. Uh, but now talk. I want to talk about a couple, couple situations which are, these were preventable. And these people were, well, they weren't even victims, really, in my opinion. Now, this, this one cracked me up. So <laughs> there's this, this woman. Now, the, the Daily Mail or the Daily Fail, whatever, but they always have the longest articles and most information in spite of themselves. It says here, the, type, the, the, the heading is no good deed goes unpunished. Okay. First of all, that dude didn't do a good deed. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. All right. So this girl, where is that girl? Where is that girl? Where is she? Hold on a second. I got to find her. I just put her face up here. I know I did. Now she's gone missing. What? what? Where is she? Hold on. Hold on. That is so not. Okay, hold on. I'm going to find her. I'm going to find her. Um, oh, there she is. I don't know. She didn't pop up here for some reason. All right. This girl. Okay, this, this girl. It says here, no good deed goes unpunished. Vegas tourist says his $35,000 Rolex was stolen by, and then has in little quotes, prostitute. Well, she was a prostitute. I don't know why I didn't use quotes around it. Who cops say is a serial watch thief. <laughs> the victim claims he took pity on a tired, and again in quotes, hooker. No, she's a hooker. <laughs> and let her, This and this is in quotes, and this deserves to be in quotes, a rest. He claims he let her rest in his hotel room. All right. So this unnamed man, because he does, does look really stupid. Yeah, you are really stupid. So anyway, two women who the man said he, knew were probably prostitutes <laughs> approached him at the casino he said the women told him they were tired and he took pity on them and allowed and allowed them to go to his room to rest mm -hmm. that's just what you always do with two completely strange hookers okay he returned to the room and fell asleep and when he awoke at 8 a.m he said one of the women had left and his thirty-five thousand dollar rolex was missing and so the woman, the, the woman I just showed you the picture of, she was the woman who took it and she'd been previously accused of stealing a $20,000 Rolex and, uh, and another watch for third and, and $35,000 in cash. She's, she's good at this. So, um, <laughs> but then the man told the police that he knew the females were probably prostitutes, but that he was not interested in anything of the sort. <laughs> I'm going to guess this dude's married. <laughs> He's not going to admit he paid for two of them to have sex with. <laughs> and he fell asleep. How drunk were you, dude? <laughs> ah, do I feel sorry for him? No, I don't. I just don't feel sorry for you. Sorry, buddy. Don't feel sorry for you. All right. <laughs> I just think he's funny. Uh, sorry. Some people deserve to be uh, in trouble. Anyway, and this guy, this guy. Now this one, let me find him. Let me see. This guy was a Florida newlywed. He's on his honeymoon night. His honeymoon night. And while his wife was sleeping, he went online looking for sex. <laughs> and he arranged to meet a prostitute while his wife was sleeping, his brand new wife. And so he got, gets to the hotel and he was arrested by an undercover detective who had posed as a prostitute as part of a human trafficking sting. And apparently... He wasn't the only one that got nailed. 176 men got nailed on that sting. <laughs> but the dude was on his honeymoon night. I mean, was there just not enough sex for this guy? He's already bored with the wife. I mean, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's like, do I feel sorry for him for getting caught in a sting? No. Do I hope that the new wife annulled that marriage like really quick? Oh, yes, I do. I hope he, she got rid of him. Um <laughs> Um, now I want to talk about, we're talking, I was talking about carjacking and my county, Prince George's County, Maryland, just put a, um, they have a curfew now, 10 o'clock curfew for a month. Uh, why did they do that? Because of the massive amount of carjackings that we have going on. And we've also had, it's this, the deadliest month in Prince George's County 
in decades with 24 killings. And these are mostly in the teenagers doing the killings and teenagers getting killed. 24 in one month. Um, and oh, part of it is the defunding of the police um, because they just aren't enough police working anymore because people are retired. The officers are retiring as soon as they can and not staying on. They can't get new people to join, especially in a county where there's a whole lot of political issues going on and accusations about the police and about racism and all kinds of things. People are like, yeah, I'm not getting involved in this mess. We don't have enough police anymore. So now the uh, county executive, uh, also Brooks, is putting on this one month curfew, thinking this is going to make a huge bit of difference. Well, I'm going to say this. If your child is out there committing carjackings and murders and running around with guns, you don't have any parents that are worth anything. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, parents. If your kid's out doing that, it's your fault. You know, all those kids are running into stores and are grabbing everything off the shelves and looting the places. They're going in packs. Your kid's picture, you can see on the video exactly. That's your daughter there. That's your son there. You can see what they're dressed like and you see their face. Are you turning your kid into the police when you see them? Probably not. You know, you're probably saying, what you bring me? <laughs> that store deserved that. What'd you bring me? If you, if your kid's out there doing that stuff, it's you, you got a lot to blame. So I'm thinking, you put a curfew out there at 10, 10 p.m., who are you going to stop? Uh, I mean, the kids are going to go and do what they want anyway because the parents aren't paying attention. And what are the police going to do when they find this kid running around? How are they going to make them go home? Because these days, if you touch the kid, you're going to get you're going to get in trouble for manhandling the kid or whatever. So I'm going to say the police are going to go, well, your kid's out here. Your kid's out here. I'm going to wait till he actually commits the big crime before I can even do anything. So that's going to be a real fat mess, real fat mess. Um, and not only Prince George's County, but this is a really interesting problem around the country, and especially in Washington, D.C. and at PG County combined. Um, they, the, the carjackings have radically increased. And what used to happen um, is that the reason there was a carjacking was a criminal would c commit a carjacking, take the car, commit a crime with the car, and then dump the car. And often across, in D.C. area, you like carjack in Maryland, you do your crime and you dump the car in D.C. or, or vice versa. And that way everything gets confused. Um, now they're not taking the cars for the purposes of committing a crime. They're just taking the cars for a joyride, a thrill, and it's become a game among a lot of teenagers. Uh, oh, you know, I got that car. They're right down the street from me. We're in a wealthy, a relatively wealthy African-American community, the wealthiest African-American community in the country. Um, just down at the, the mall, that's like, what, two miles from me? Two, two teenage girls carjack somebody right out of there, broad daylight. I mean, and this is, a, this, this is, generally speaking, was a safe community, but now this is gotten out of hand. Um, so the carjackings have just increased with 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds. There was a 14-year-old girl and a 15-year-old girl who carjacked a, a man in uh, D.C. and he died in the carjacking. I mean, unbelievable. And so what the heck is going on? And they're trying to determine, was it COVID that made people, the kids are so bored, they just don't know what to do with themselves anymore? Um, but what makes you think carjacking is okay? I mean, that's a, that's a major crime. We're not talking about shoplifting a pen out of the five and dime. You know, we're talking about a lot of times with a gun, you know, or to stop the car and put the gun and throw the person out and jump in and drive off. And a lot of times a uh, person gets killed. Um, so we're having a really, really bad time um, right now with carjacking issues. And it's, it's kind of, really frightening. So, um, and another thing, uh, one of who, who asked me about this, um, I, I'm, oh, is Julie here? Julie is not here. Julie had asked me a really interesting question. I'm going to, I want to talk to about that because about, and I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that case. It's the, um, what's his name? Uh, Paris Bennett, Paris Bennett, uh, when he was 13, he raped and murdered his four-year-old sister fascinating story. And I'm going to, I'll give you a link to the, uh, uh YouTube, uh, video on it. It was from, I think it's from ID. Um, but it's a really fascinating thing. I'm going to talk about that in a second, but before I go on to that, I just want to talk about, uh, we had the issue about 
the stabbings in uh, Saskatchewan, um, where, where these two guys went nutsy and just stabbed a whole bunch of people in Saskatchewan. And it's unusual because it's not a, not a, not a gun, gun mass murder. It's a stabbing mass murder. And one of the questions was, is this more common than we think, the use of knives and mass murders? And it's interesting, in countries that do not have, who have stronger gun laws, yeah, there's more knife mass murders. Japan is known for more knife mass murders, and so is China. Um, places like Jamaica, it seems like, well, they have guns and machetes down there, so they kind of <laughs> do both. They don't actually have that many mass murders in Jamaica, which is interesting. Um, I think they just have a high crime rate, so... They're, the guys are busy doing other things. Um, but uh, yeah, so there, there are mass murders with knives um, and with uh, vehicles where you just run everybody over with the vehicle. So, you know, there, there's there's a number of different ways you can commit a mass murder um, and, and have a high body count other than with a gun, which, you you know, people always think it's just the guns you have a high body count, and that's not necessarily true. So, I mean, obviously, if you... It is. It seems to be an easier way, but the knives and the um, machetes and the the vehicles can do a pretty good job themselves. So just just just, just want to point that out. Now let me talk about uh, let me talk about the Paris Bennett case because I was asked about psychopathy and we're talking about we're talking about teenagers who are out there carjacking and we're talking about teenagers who are getting involved in all kinds of other crimes. What the heck is going on? Is there an increase in psychopathy? And so let me read a little bit of what this question was for me. And then I, I want to point out this case of Paris Bennett, because what well, is he a psychopath? You, you betcha he is. But um, hold on a second. I just had this in front of me and now I made a mistake. Okay. Nope. That's not it. Okay. We're going to do with it. Oh, by the way, the Ellen Greenberg case has been reopened. Uh, that that is fascinating. This is the woman who they they claimed was committed suicide, like by stabbing herself, like how many times in the back of the head. Um, uh, finally, they, I did a, a, um, a video on that. I believe it's murder, and now they've reopened the case. Thank God. Thank God. All right. Um, where did my thing go? Hold on a second. Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, uh, this was a question coming in about what happens with a difficult child, okay? Somebody who's psychopathic, but, you know, how did they, how, what do you do with these children? How do they develop, you know, why do they commit the crimes? What do you do with them after they commit the crimes? So what happens to a child who grows up and has not a problem committing a heinous crime against their own like, own family member. And I have done uh, shows before on this, but this particular character, um, let me let me find him here. This is the guy. This is Paris Bennett, and that's when he was arrested at 13 years old. Here he is now sitting. Is that when he's in prison or is that before? I might be before prison. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, that's the way he's now been in prison, like six years or something like that. Um, and he was only 13 when he raped and murdered by stabbing her like 14 times, his four-year-old sister. Now, the show that is on um, YouTube, which I recommend you watch, is this one called uh, My Son Killed My Daughter Documentary. Actually, that's not the name of it, um, but that's what it's listed under. And I'll put it below. Um uh, it is fascinating. Now that's, by the way, that's that's not 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 the mother. That's the grandmother who was arrested for killing her husband, um, and then she got she was found not guilty. But okay, <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. I might have to look into that one further. But anyway, she had. This is the mother of the. This is the mother of the, the kid. Um, so let me, let me pull up this stuff so I can read you what this story is basically. All right. So, so this is, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay. He was only 13 years old, Paris Bennett, when he committed the heinous atrocity. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison and has been in jail since being arrested in 2007. How did such a normal looking boy end up killing his sister in such a savage manner at such a young age? And that has confused everybody. Bennett has been described as a psychopath because of the vile nature of his crime. 
Charity Lee, that's his mother, Charity Lee. Bennett's mother explains that she was shaken by the events. Well, one, one would hope she was shaken. That unfolded on February 5th, 2007. Lee had been working her regular waitressing job and had left her children under the supervision of a babysitter. In the absence of his mother, Bennett schemed and persuaded the babysitter to leave so that he could harm his sister without any intrusion. All right, why did he do such a thing? All right, now, when you, when you watch this show, okay, um, it starts out, I, the mom thinking very sad about this, but she's still seeing, she's still communicating with her son in prison. She has learned to forgive him and all, oh, you know, and it sounds, you know, she's, you can get a little sympathy going for her. And as the story goes on, you start to say to yourself, wait a minute here. Why did this kid kill his little sister? And supposedly at some point he said he wanted to get back at his mother because, you know, he wasn't the center of attention after his little sister was born. And then there was, he was supposedly watching violent pornography and then wanted to rape and murder his little sister. There's all kinds of stories about this. But you say, yeah, then they show all these videos of the two of them together and he's happy and he's playing with his little sister and saying he loves her. And you think they look so normal. They, you know, I don't see anything in these, this kid that looks abnormal or this family. But here's what happens. And I think this is really important to to understand that why does a child end up being psychopathic? Was he born that way or was it the environment? Now, let's take a look at mommy. Uh, let's take a look at this woman. I'm sorry, uh, her mother. Let's look at her mother first. Remember, this is this is the woman. Um, where's, where's the, oh, I'm trying to find. Okay, this is, this is her mom. This is the grandmother. Apparently, he's been married seven times. Seems to have a whole lot of money and supposedly, according to police, they arrested and tried her for, they thought, hiring a hit on her husband. And she was found not guilty. But meanwhile, sounds like she was raised by a questionable mother um, who, throughout the video, it sort of comes off that the grandmother is a kind of a cold creature um, and Maybe the grandmother has some narcissistic or psychopathic tendencies. So then we get to mommy. All right, what is what about mommy? All right. So apparently, mommy, as a teenager, has issues and gets into heroin uh, at like 15, 16 years old, and then supposedly gets off of it. And then she meets somebody. I think she, I think she married one of them. Maybe she said she'd been married twice. So I'm not sure how that quite worked out. But she says. Oh, my mother and I have a similar problem. We just can't pick good dudes. Okay, sure. Um, but you pick these guys, you have babies with them. And so you have these two children from two different fathers and the fathers aren't in their lives. So now we have essentially an irresponsible, selfish mom who is putting these children in, in, in the, in, into the world. And she said this interesting thing. She says, I, I like to have total control over the kids. I don't like people messing, interfering. Okay, maybe there's more to this story than the husbands just ran away. Maybe the problem is you didn't want them around. You want to do whatever you wanted to do. Um, interesting enough, while her, her kill, killer son is in prison, she has another child. Yes, she does. Where's the, where's the other child? But by the way, this is a little girl he killed off. Um, and she has another child while he's in prison. There's the new one. He's called Phoenix. Oh, what a name. Um, rising, the dead child rising, right? Uh, okay, it's a boy. Um, anyway, where's the dad in the, there? Oh, no dad again. So now, now she's brought another child into the world that she doesn't have a father for. And on top of that, she's now having the killer son communicate with the other son. She goes, I don't trust him, but I want to, it's his, it's his brother. Okay, so now you're raising this kid without a father, and you're gonna when he gets older, you're gonna tell him, oh yeah, your older brother killed your sister. Well, that's nice. Um, and then the psychiatrist has said to her, you might want to just, I think it was Park Deeds said, just change your name and, and run away because if your son gets out of prison, he'll want to kill you. Well, what about wanting to kill his brother? He's a psychopath. He didn't like the tension his sister got. So what if he gets out of prison and decides to knock off his brother? He might want to get back at you again. 
you know, because apparently he got back at you once by killing your daughter. Now he could kill your other son. What kind, what kind of thinking is this? Is this an appropriate thing to do? My guess is <laughs> she just wanted to do what she wanted to do. Now, the next thing you wonder is, did she have no clue that her son, Paris, was a psychopath? Well, you watch half this film and it seems like he's the nicest guy ever. And then they start telling the story where everybody says, oh, first of all, apparently he wasn't in her care from the very beginning. So she was off doing something and left him with somebody else. So he didn't. So he was sort of abandoned. Um, so we have that early possible um, problem with that. He's you know not connecting with his mother um, and that often is a problem with psychopaths um, that they they have this attachment disorder because they never got the proper attachment to their mother. Certainly sounds like she contributed to that. Then as he's growing up, apparently did things like slamming his head into walls and all kinds of things that are concerning, like this, for example. Oh, let me see. I hope I have this one. Hmm. Oh, where is it? Oh, is it this? Oh, it's this one. Look at what it says. She says, what's your favorite? He said, what's your favorite? phrase kill charity's children he says what your son just said kill Ch charity's children what kind of kid says that so this kid's really scary really scary apparently that's a lovely family picture yeah okay is this one too oh okay psychopathy checklist yeah he's he like checked all those anyway here's the thing that really drove me nuts he Two, two things. And this shows you probably why he is the way he is. Okay, so we go to Charity the mom again. Mom, apparently, he tries to kill her. <laughs> he does. Three months before he killed his, his little sister, he's tried to kill her. He goes, they took, she took him to, he got, I guess he got put in a mental institution. She didn't keep him there. She brought him home. She didn't get treatment for him. And she says, well, I don't think it might, would have made any difference. Really? He killed your daughter. But you just think you don't have, you don't feel guilty about the fact you didn't get him any treatment, right? Then three months later, after she tries to kill her, she leaves him alone with a babysitter and her daughter. So now you have a violent, dangerous, Possibly, and they said he was homicidal. They told her he was homicidal. You live your, leave your little, his little, him alone with his little sister. Oh yeah, the babysitter. I guess you didn't mind if your homicidal son killed your babysitter. Did you tell your the babysitter? Oh, by the way, my son is homicidal. That babysitter was lucky as heck that he told her to go out of the house before he killed this, the, the little kid. He could have just killed the babysitter too. What, what, what kind of person leaves their homicidal son with a teenage babysitter? That's sick. That's sick. And do you know what she said? And this is the thing that really threw me. She said she had no regrets over anything she had done, except that prior to this murder happening, she had slipped back into drug addiction. That was her only regret. I'm going to say, mommy, you may be psychopathic too. So I think your son didn't fall far from that really, really poison apple tree. That's my opinion on on that particular case. I just think really, really frightening. Oh, did you see, oh, you actually saw that one. It's a, it's a fascinating documentary. It really was. Um, and then that's why I'm going to link it here. Um, because it, just the way, I mean, I don't know if, I don't even know if they're trying to make her look good because she also wrote a book and she probably made a lot of money on that book, which always appalls me when, um, so, yeah, so she's getting a lot of attention. Now she runs some group in, in her daughter's name to help people. And I'm like, sorry, sorry. Um, you're an irresponsible, in my opinion, possibly very psychopathic human being yourself. You have no regrets. No regrets. You think you did nothing wrong. You don't think you didn't pay enough attention to the kid that you abandoned him when you, need, you were a drug addict that you left him alone with a child when you knew he was a uh, uh, homicidal. You left the babysitter there. You, di you didn't get him any help, but you have no regrets because you don't feel responsible. And let me let me put this up while I'm at it. Okay, let me put up the psychopathy checklist. 
All right. When you look at the psychopathic checklist, glibness and superficial charm. I think she and both the son have that. A need for stimulation. I don't know about this pathological lying. I wouldn't be surprised on all of their parts. Cunning and manipulative. Lack. Look at number six. Lack of remorse or guilt. That is a huge issue. Lack of remorse or guilt. And that is one of the, a lack of empathy. A lack of empathy too. I didn't see her have a lot of empathy for the murdered child. I think she's making, I think she's getting more attention because of her murdered child than she got with the child being alive. Um, I see a lack of empathy. Um, she has empathy for her killer son, supposedly. I think she just likes the attention of the killer son because she can write a book about it. She can go to prison and see him. And I think she's highly narcissistic and she has no remorse over anything she did. She thinks whatever I did was perfectly fine. That's just really, really sad. But that's, you wonder, wonder where that, um, uh, let's see, and Lila says, I keep telling you, Pat, if I were president, people would need to get a license to have children, and this one would not qualify. <laughs> you betcha. Oh, my God. It's just unbelievable. And it's sad because she's already, two children already, two children down, and I wouldn't be surprised if that third one's going to turn into a piece of crap or get killed. And she will she have any remorse over that? Probably not. She'll just go, oh, well. Too bad. Grandma seems to be the same way. What what a bunch of mm, mm, mm. lovely people, lovely people. All right, I just I thought that was really interesting. Now I had a request for, um, and I, I'm not sure if I actually talked about this before, but the the request was this. Hold on a second. Uh, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Um, was for. One of these I cannot do because uh, oh, Benny, I know Benny's not here because it's too late for him. He wants me to do things on, on the Ryan Widmer case, and I will, but I can't do that on, on, a, on this. I'll have to do that when I have time because uh, it's going to take more. I have to do a lot of research, and I'll probably do a whole show on that. Um, then I had a request for, oh, Nancy, uh, would you consider analyzing the William Desmond Taylor case? He was, this was from way back in 1922. He was a guy, he was an actor who was killed. I think it was an actor or was a producer or something was, was murdered um, and found dead in his doorway. Um, it's a really interesting case, but I want to look, I want to analyze the suspects in that case a little bit more before I, I do anything about it. And the other one was a case of uh, Virginia Rapp. Um, and I will talk about Virginia Rapp. I, I may have talked about this before. I can't remember. <laughs> Sometimes I have so many that I've done, I forget which ones I already talked about. But Virginia Rapp, this one I can talk about because it's, um, this is the case. I'm going to pull it up here. Of, uh, this is Fatty Arbuckle. He was the uh, silent film actor uh, back in the, um, he was born in 1987 and he died in 1933. And what's interesting about this case and why it's worth, and she's a, and she's an actress, by the way, she was an actress. Okay. But let, and he, he was well loved and uh, Buster Keaton really loved this guy and, and try to really try to help him out. Here is a guy, interesting case. And when we talk about sexual assault and the issue of false reporting, she did not falsely report him. But one of her friends did. Um, and I think it was a false report. And he went through three trials and it ruined his life. And three civil, I mean, um, three trials with civilian jurors. As you know, I don't like the civilian jury system. Uh, I think finally the third jury got it right and found him not guilty. But the other two are mistrials because there were some who just believed he had to be guilty. Okay. What happened? Let me tell you what happened. All right. So anyway. So the story is on 1921, Arbuckle, the Fatty Arbuckle, they call him Fatty Arbuckle because kind of he was kind of porky. It was, and this is important in the case. So don't don't accuse me of being you know fat shaming. The dude was fat, <laughs> okay, and it plays into the whole whatever what happened in this case. He took a break from his hectic film schedule, and despite suffering second degree burns to both buttocks from an onset accident, drove to San Francisco with two friends. The three checked into three rooms at the Saint. Francis Hotel, 
uh, Arbuckle and Fishback to share one and another one for the other guy. And the other room was going to be a party room. Several women were invited to the suite. During the carousing, a 30-year-old aspiring actress named Virginia Rapp was found seriously ill in room 1219, okay, um, and was examined by the hotel doctor, who concluded her symptoms were mostly caused by intoxication and gave her morphine to calm her. She was not hospitalized until two days after the incident. At the hospital, Rapp's companion at the party, Bambina Maud Delmont, okay, this Bambina is the one that set this whole thing into motion told the doctor that Arbuckle had raped her friend. The doctor examined Rapp, but found no evidence of rape. She died one day after her hospitalization for peritonitis caused by a ruptured bladder. Rapp suffered from chronic urinary tract infections, a condition that liquor irritated dramatically. All right. Delmont then told the police that Arbuckle had raped Rapp. The police concluded that the impact of Arbuckle's overweight body lying on top of rap had eventually caused her bladder to rupture. So he squashed her, <laughs> supposedly. So now, first of all, we don't have, we don't A, know that a sexual act occurred at this point. We don't know that it wasn't consensual. Okay. And then the next thing is, regardless of what was consensual, was rape. Would his weight have caused her bladder to rupture, which is interesting because usually you can you can tell me if I'm wrong, but usually even fat dudes would prop them if they're going to be on top of the lady, not from behind or some other way. That usually they use their arms to prop themselves up, and even if they're porky. Theoretically, that's just that's fat, and it shouldn't cause the exact weight in that area to be so comp compressing to the bladder area that it would actually rupture the bladder. That's a pretty strange. I, I personally have never heard of a bladder being ruptured that way. Now, there is other possibilities. Okay, of how the bladder would be ruptured. Now, these are uh, you know way way more likely than the other ones. Okay, so. All right. At a later press conference, Rapp's manager accused Arbuckle of using a piece of ice to simulate sex with Rapp, thus leading to her injuries. A piece of ice. Huh? What, an icicle? Like a big, huge piece of icicle? You know. Um, uh, by the time the story was reported in the newspapers, the object had involved a Coca-Cola or champagne bottle rather than a piece of ice. Champagne bottle seems more realistic to me because at least it has a long neck on it. You know what I mean? And that can cause the rupturing of the bladder if that is inserted. Uh, definitely saw that in the in the, the rape case that I, I did the show on in India. Unfortunately, uh, that woman was attacked with many objects and um, and she had a lot of things ruptured. Uh, so that would be more likely than the fact he was fat and laid on her, you know. In fact, the witnesses testified. But here's what they actually testified to. Witnesses testified that Arbuckle had rubbed ice on her stomach to ease her abdominal pain. So essentially she was, I guess, lying there going, I'm in so much pain and he brought some ice and thought that would cool down her, you know, whatever was causing the pain there. Um, Arbuckle denied any wrongdoing. Dalmont later made a statement incriminating Arbuckle to the police in an attempt to extort money from Arbuckle's attorneys. Arbuckle's trial was a major media event. The story was fueled by yellow journalism, the same stuff we have today, um, with the newspapers portraying Arbuckle as a gross lecher who used his weight to overpower innocent girls. So in other words, <laughs> he was the rapist crusher or the crushing rapist. I don't know what you want to call him. So basically he restrained women by plopping himself on top of them. Um, Hearst nationwide newspaper chain exploited the situation with exaggerated and essentially sensationalized stories. Hearst was gratified by the profits he accrued during the Arbuckle scandal and later said he had sold more newspapers than any event since the sinking of the Lusitania. Morality groups called for Arbuckle to be sentenced to death. The resulting scandal destroyed Arbuckle's career along with his personal life. Anyway, people who knew him said he was a good-natured man who was shy around women and was not the type to do anything like that. He was easygoing, wouldn't hurt a fly. Oh, who knows? Who's, who knows what kind of guy he, you know, whether he's a great guy or not. But Anyway, look about the trials. So he goes to trial, right? Um, they, they 
when they went to trial, um, oof, let's see. It was the prosecutor apparently made public pronouncements of Arbuckle's guilt and pressured witnesses to make false statements. Brady at first used Delmont as his star witness during the indictment hearing, but the defense also obtained a letter from Delmont admitting to a plan to extort money, a uh, payment from Arbuckle. So you had these two not so great sides. Oh, and then after hearing testimony from one of the party guests, Zay Previn, that Rapp told her, in quotes, Roscoe hurt me on her deathbed. And after this person claimed that on her deathbed, she said, Roscoe hurt me. The judge decided that he should be charged with first degree murder. It was later charged, reduced to manslaughter. Okay. Now he was arrested and he's, uh, let's see, go, they go to trial. Um, and the hotel doctor who had examined Rapp testified that an external force seemed to have damaged the bladder. But during cross-examination, uh, what is that here? I'm sorry. Oh, that they found out that she had never mentioned when he was treating her, she never mentioned that she had been assaulted. So, you know, they brought a, you know, she had complained of pain. They brought a doctor to the hotel. Now, usually if you rape people, you don't want to bring the doctor right on over. So when the person is coherent and can talk and explain things to the doctor, you really, the rapist would probably not bring in a doctor. But they brought the doctor in and the doctor never, she never said anything to the doctor that she had been raped. So both sides, uh, the rape, the supposed rapist and the supposed woman supposedly having been raped, neither one of them would have reason to either bring a doctor or say not say anything to the doctor. Um, so they also thought that she might have had cancer, which caused a lot of the, the bladder issues. And she also was, I guess, an alcoholic. So that was also problematic. So at any rate... Um, when, uh, so, so then there's some more information here. Um, supposedly, Arbuckle discovered Rapp in the bathroom and, and vomiting into a toilet. He claimed that Rapp told him she felt ill and asked to lie down, and he carried her into the bedroom and asked a few of the party guests to help treat her. So he brought other people in, supposedly. Unless they all raped her, then, you know, he wouldn't have done that. When Arbuckle and a few of the guests re-entered the room, they found Rapp on the floor near the bed, tearing at her clothing, going to violent convulsions. To calm Rapp down, they placed her in a bathtub of cool water. Then they took her to the other room and called the hotel manager and doctor. They, Everybody thought she was very drunk, including the doctors. Um, probably assuming Rapp would sleep, sleep it off, Arbuckle then left. Okay? Um, so anyway... <sighs> There's just, uh, it's just amazing. When you read this, there's just a million different, he's never had any inappropriate sexual advances against women before. There are a whole bunch of doctors said that she was very ill. They deadlocked. So they had a second trial. Then they had a third trial. Um, and the third trial, he finally was acquitted. And they actually said that acquittal is not enough for Roscoe Arbuckle. We feel a great injustice has been done to him. So then he, they, they can't, he you know, finally was found innocent, but his whole life was ruined. And uh, so now this is the problem um, with, you know, you, we always think of the victims as the, the, the rape, the victims as people who are raped, but there are also victims who are accused of rape. And I think we have to understand that those both exist and they all both exist in, you know, and what, and no, and having feelings for one does not mean you don't have feelings for the other. I mean, rape of to be a rape victim is a horrifying thing, and anybody who rapes somebody should be put away. Um, but on the other hand, somebody who accuses somebody of rape who didn't rape, they should be put away because that can destroy life just as well as rape can. So, you know, to be fair, we have to be. That's why you have to be extremely careful when you're when you're dealing with rape. You have to um, you have to be sure it really happened. You know what I mean? You have to make sure you have the evidence. And it gets really tough sometimes as to, uh, oh, I wanted to bring that up. Oh, yeah. Um, I watched, there's a new movie out called Unbelievable. And it is a, a true story. And I think it's on Netflix. Um, Unbelievable. It's about a, a young woman who was in the foster care system and got tossed from house to house to house and then she wakes up one night and a, and a man has broken into her house he's in he's, he's dressed in black he's got a mask on he's got a knife he rapes her 
and then takes pictures of her after he raped her and basically threatens if you say anything i'll put these pictures out there anyway she called she does call and contact the police she goes through the whole first um, video shows the process that a rape victim goes through and it's very unpleasant it's extremely embarrassing humiliating unpleasant and the amount of time she had to repeat what happened to her is pretty horrific um i think they probably the two detectives they had in there were really mean to her and i think that that may have been overblown although they didn't believe her and eventually apologized later when found out that it was true she had been raped uh because some some other people other women got raped by the same guy and then they found when they got the guy they found pictures of her <laughs> that the guy had taken just like she said and the problem was did the why didn't they believe her um and there were some interesting reasons that they questioned that she was telling the truth. One was that she had a real questionable past as far as her behavior goes and her her believability. Um, they did not find certain certain kinds of evidence that would have proven anything. He used a condom in the commission of the rape, so there was no semen. Um, she changed her story a couple of times that they made them question it. Interesting enough, I felt she was telling the truth from, from, it's just, just, this is a, a fictional reenactment of what happened, but here was my experience about when people are telling the truth and when they're not, when they're, when they're in the hospital and they, uh, they're going through the whole thing, they're going through the rape kit and all that. Usually what I found is that a, wo a woman or a young girl or whatever, uh, you know, teenage girl, college girl, young woman, if they've really, really been raped, there is no moment when they have any levity. Um, one girl that I know, she just cried for her mom over and over again. I just want my mommy. I want my mommy. She's a college student. Uh, and I never questioned she had been raped. Um, but there are other girls who just want to go out for breakfast, <laughs> you know, and you're like, you just got, you just said you were raped, but now you just, they're like, ah, chit-chatting with your friend you want to go out for breakfast that makes you question what really happened whether it was more a case of consensual that didn't turn out well or whatever but you someone who has truly been raped i'm sorry they say people act differently i've never seen somebody who's been in a brutal rape just chit-chat and want to go to denny's <laughs> you know that doesn't happen because you're so devastated um now you everybody acts differently but i mean there's reasons why it's difficult for uh, detectives when they talk when they when somebody's giving the story as to what they what they believe. They've dealt with a lot of false reporting. It does happen a lot more than people think it does. And so they're because of that, they look at everybody and go, "Is that person telling the truth?" And in a case of a violent rape, there's really usually no question. You know, the person's you know bruised and beaten up, and there's there, there's no question. Just like okay, that person was raped. But there's the other ones that are where they, they're, they're very quiet and they don't really, they don't really seem that disturbed. And then you're like, why is that? It, it's a very difficult thing to say, is this person false reporting or are they just traumatized in such a way that I can't recognize that they actually, this is just, they really were raped and they just can't express very well and whatever their issues are. And this, in this particular case, the girl looked traumatized. So I, I never felt that they, she was that unbelievable. Um, so I don't know, so say, say it's, a, it's, a, it's a dramatized version, but I just want to point out that it's tough. It's really tough. And, but the whole process of how rape victim, what the rape victims go through, I think needs to be, and I think some places are handling it better. They have specific people working with and the police department now that know how to deal with this kind of thing so that the, the woman isn't, or the victim, because it can be a male, isn't re-traumatized over and over and over and over again and has to tell the story 700 times um, in, a, in, in such a cold fashion and such a humiliating fashion. And it's, it's humiliating enough to go through just the rape kit and the, they take photos of your body and everything. It's just like you've already been raped and now you got to stand naked in front of people and have pictures taken. And it just sucks. I mean, it's horrifying. So anything that can be done to make the process better, I'm all for that. But I just also want to point out that it can be very difficult to determine if you don't see a lot of um, uh, violence to the body, whether something really happened or didn't happen. So sometimes it gets really tough. You know, just uh, not an easy job to have that happen. Um, 
Well, uh, let's see. Uh, huh. Lila says, what is interesting is fa Fatty Arbuckle is animated over a million a year in the 1920s. Holy crap. That is <laughs> that's a that's a big penny. <laughs> wow. That that is that is unbelievable. Um uh let's see. Oh yes, 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 yes. I did not get to this part of it. Yeah. Hadn't she just had an abortion? And if so, wouldn't this more likely be the culprit? If so, it could have been illegal at the time and may have been botched. Absolutely. I forgot that was one of the things that had happened. Yes. Um, easily that she was perforated, got an infection. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, absolutely. Yeah, I forgot about that. Thank you for bringing that up. That's really important. Um, Anne says, Amber Heard was just perfect after she said she was raped with a bottle of Coke or vodka. But, of course, she was a big liar. <laughs> yeah, she was a big liar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know there are some horrific rapes which do involve uh, objects, um, which are pretty nasty. Um, but, yeah, we can't. <laughs> Amber Heard is not one to be believed, shall we say that. And, you know, it's one of these situations, and this, again, what, what the police have to deal with. Let's say a woman comes in and she, she says, I was raped. She gives a, a phony baloney story, and it's clearly true she wasn't raped. So they, then they toss her out. She doesn't get charged because it's very rare that anybody gets charged for false reporting on rapes. It's rare, and it should be not rare, but it is um, because everybody's always afraid. What if we're just this much wrong? You know. Um, so then she comes back in another day because I know somebody <laughs> I interpreted once back in the hospital for a patient who she. She got raped two days in a row. She went to different hospitals each time she got raped. Um, <laughs> and I knew she was lying because she's a psychopath. Anyway, and, and, and again, remember I say how chatty people are? So uh, she, she's in there and she's, she's naked and she's got into the, all the pictures. Everything's being done. She's told the police whatever. As soon as they walk out, she's like, hey, what's up? How are your kids? You know, she was really cheery, you know. And then when the doctor came back, she was sad again. And then when I talked to her, she goes, I'm really hungry. Can you, can you get cookies for me? <laughs> I knew she was lying. And I interpreted for both times. So I interpreted one day. And then the next day, I got a rape victim coming into the other hospital. I remember joking, I bet it's her. And it was. I walked in and said, what? You were, you were raped again? She goes, yeah. Can you believe it? And I'm like, not really. <laughs> and so apparently she got off a bus and got raped both times. Anyway. Now, what, now, the interesting thing is this. So they did not believe her. Okay, two times, fake, fake, fake rape, fake false reporting, two times. But, you know, she did hang in shady areas, mind you, and she's deaf, so that means that she's an easy target because she can't hear them coming, you know. Especially she can't hear deaf guys, by the way, just, just so you know this interesting thing. Deaf guys prefer to rape deaf women because they know she can't hear them coming. <laughs> You know, true, absolutely true. Um, so she would could be a target for a rapist. Um, and so let's say the third time, so boy who cried wolf. In this case, it's the deaf girl who cried wolf. She gets really raped the third time. She comes back in there like that girl again. Please come back in and say, oh my God, not her. They're already believe she's a liar. So unfortunately, folks. Past behavior does affect how people treat you, uh, so and 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 your reputation and what you were doing. So much as much as we would like to think that none of these things matter, they matter. Um, so when some when you when a girl gets really smashed, you know, smashed, she's totally super drunk off her butt, and she can't quite remember what happened, and she accuses someone of committing a rape while she's out of it. How do we know that was a rape? How do we know she didn't say yes when she was drunk off her butt and then woke up and went, oh, I had sex with that. You know? And that's what happens quite often. Um, so the problem is then the police are sitting there going, we don't know what's true and what isn't. So I say, obviously, extremely violent rapes. Uh, woman's attacked walking down the street, back coming home from work. Somebody breaks, jump, the girl did have somebody break into her house and that was an unusual case, but normally when that happens, there's not much question. Uh, 
But with the use of condoms, too, that really can screw things up because obviously there's no evidence of semen. And that makes them go, was she really right? But now, you know, with the advent of DNA issues, like way back in time, rapists didn't use condoms because they weren't worried about DNA. Now they've gotten smart and they do worry about DNA, so they use condoms. So sometimes that just really, you know, that, that's messing up a lot of proof of, of a rape actually occurring. So that really sucks. Um, so uh, that makes things tough. So it's funny, some advances make things easier and some advances in science make things tougher. And therefore we have to wade through all of that and always hope that we don't become a victim of a crime because, you know, some of the, say, some of these guys are getting really smart and they're learning how not to leave evidence around. So, and it becomes harder to prove. And sometimes the police can't do anything about it. What are they going to do? You know, if they can't prove it. They're like, you know, they know the prosecution is never going to take it to, to court because there's just not enough proof. Um, so sometimes victims of crimes are, they don't get any justice and as far as sad. I think that's all I have tonight. I think I've covered all the ones I wanted to cover this time. Um, so I was going to do the case I'm involved, the court case I'm involved in. I was going to do that on Sunday, but I've decided to wait um, because I do not want to put uh, information out right now that the, the media can get hold of because I don't want to talk to the media till the case is over. So, um, uh, so I'm going to do the Amy Bradley disappearance off the cruise ship instead this on, on this Sunday. That'll be what I do Sunday. And then I'll be attending the trial. I'm not going to talk about which one it is at this point. Uh, I'll be attending the trial during the week and see what's up. All I'm going to say is this, that I did identify the guy who I believe committed the crime as soon as I was brought in 24 years ago. And they police didn't do anything with it. And they just two years ago, then they finally, the cold case squad went after him and charged him and he took a plea deal. He was already in prison. Um, but now they're claiming there is another person involved in the crime and that the man in prison was hired as a, it was a hired hitman, which I see zero evidence of. I do not know that the other person is guilty at all. I question this whole thing. And this is what I'm real curious to find out because as far as I know, the prosecution doesn't seem to have a case. Uh, they, they, they sent me a um, subpoena to testify on their behalf, but I'm like, what am I testifying? You know, what, what do you, what do you, what do you even want me to testify to? Um, and so they, the prosecutor talked to me and I'm like, you're kind of out of your mind. And then she wrote me back. She goes, thank you very much. We're not going to call you for call you. I'm good. good. Now I can go to the court and watch the case. <laughs> so very, very, it's going to be fascinating when I finally finish it up. It's a really interesting case, but I want to see what the prosecution has got that I just don't necessarily think makes any sense, but maybe they have some smoking gun that I don't know about. And if they do, interesting, but I don't know that they do. Anyway, uh, so that'll be Sunday at 3 p.m. And this time it will be 3 p.m. Sorry I put the wrong time on the <laughs> on the show today. I'm glad you made it here anyway. Uh, thank God. Um, and so, again, if you're new to the show, please do like and subscribe or join Patreon below uh, or click click on the little dollar sign, support the channel another way. Always helps to get support. And I will see you uh, on, yeah, on Sunday. Bye. <laughs>